Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Q and A session with uh, scientists from Thermo Fisher Scientific at uh, San Jose. So before we begin the session and start uh, intro and questions, uh, let me share a small intro video about our campus at San Jose. So here's the video. So that was a small intro video, uh, basically showing our campus. And you guys would have noticed that uh, because of COVID, there is a lot of restrictions. Site access is limited to crucial employees. We have temperature monitoring to keep our employees safe. So let's begin with uh, introducing our panelists. Uh, let me go first. I am a mechanical engineer in R&D department, and. Uh, I work with scientists. They gave us some ideas and we try to develop some prototypes for them to test. And once everything looks good, we try to go for full production. My name is uh, Deeptanshu Arnold and I have been with Thermo Fisher for over a year now. Uh, today with us, we have uh, three scientists. Uh, all are from R&D group. And uh, let me ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, let's go according to what I see on my screen. Philips, uh, would you be kind enough to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Philip Remish. I'm from Minnesota. Um, I studied analytical chemistry, so I have a PhD in, in that. And I uh, came to San Jose uh, 12 years ago. And so I'm what Deep called a scientist. And so I kind of work on these systems and, and um, try to develop them and make them better. And then try to then tell Deep what, what it is that he can try to help us uh, make so yeah thank you so yeah uh, i would like to add that uh, i am just one of the mechanical engineers we have a whole team of them so it's not only me uh, there are other people who also work with scientists and uh, as a team we come together and uh, build new products okay so next up is michael uh, please uh, introduce yourself hi i'm michael belford i'm also a scientist in the r d uh, 
department. Um, I work directly with DEEP, actually. We're uh, teammates on, on a project currently. Um, I've been here for 17 years now. Um, I grew up in Florida, and I, I got my PhD in analytical chemistry, like, like Phil did. Okay. Uh, next up, we have uh, Pablo. Uh, Pablo, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. I'm uh, Pablo Nieto Ramos. I'm also a scientist in R&D. Uh, well, I come originally from Spain, but then I spent some years in Germany and end up just here in the U.S. where I have been working in Thermo for two years. I'm originally uh, did my PhD in solid state physics, but uh, did a lot of mass spectrometry, which was what brought me to, to Thermo. I work in yeah, similar as uh, they say, so just like developing just new instrument just to make, uh, yeah, to improve just the capabilities of scientific, scientific instrument mass spectrometry. Okay, so now we, you know, our panelists. So now we can open uh, Q&A. Uh, if any attendees have any questions, uh, you can uh, type it in and we'll try to answer as we go along. Other than that, uh, I have a few questions for our scientists. Uh, first off, uh, what are the kind of instruments, scientific instruments we are building at our San Jose sites and what are their implications in the real world? Who would like to take that? It's a big question. <laughs> I, can, I can start it. I can just say that we, um, we make, as Pablo was saying, these instruments called mass spectrometers and they're really fancy instruments that weigh molecules. And this kind of, kind of sounds a little esoteric and out there, but it's actually a really powerful technique for figuring out what's in something. And that's like the main question that an analytical scientist tries to answer, what's in a sample? So if you know how much it weighs, you can tell, you, you can separate things out and tell how much of things there are. I don't know if uh, Michael or Pablo would like to say something. No, I, I think that's a, a, a good introduction. Um, I generally like to think of our, our instruments as three components. Um, we, we need the, the mass analyzer in order to do the, the weighing that, that Phil mentioned. We need a detector um, to actually detect the ion current um, that, that is attributed to those uh, different molecules. Um, but the section that I work in is in the ionization. And that's where we take the molecules and ionize them in a multitude of different ways. But uh, as you can imagine, that's very important because with a neutral molecule, we, we don't really have a lot of control over them. But once we ionize them, we can really push and pull them with uh, different kinds of fields, electric fields, magnetic fields. So that's the area that I work in, in the ionization and in the sources group. Pablo, you would like to add something? Yeah, well, I think they described it very good, but uh, just to, to run it up a little bit. So, so yeah, basically what we are working, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, in the way uh, Philip and Michael said, and we are working is just pushing just like, uh, uh, so to say, the time. So we, we can just analyze, well, as good as possible. So weighting the molecules uh, as, as fast as possible, as, as accurate as possible. So that is always just for us, just like, a, like a, yeah, looking just forward just to make the things faster and better, so, so to say. And this is just really the challenge, just to push those limits. And uh, who are our customers? Who actually buys this equipment and what do they do with them? Well, as you can imagine, um, one of the biggest uh, uh, uses right now is in, in uh, pharmaceutics. So drug research, drug development, obviously that's quite important nowadays. Um, that's, we have a big group of uh, customers that work in that area. We, uh, we test food, um, water analysis, both for food and for uh, environmental to make sure that there's not pollutants in the, uh, the water. Um, gosh, yeah, it's almost easier to ask who doesn't use mass spectrometers in the science field nowadays. It seems to be uh, pretty ubiquitous. Okay, so actually I have started getting some questions from our attendees. First off, uh, so Omar wants to know, how do you actually ionize a noble gas? You know, it's funny, we don't actually, I mean, you can ionize an, almost anything if you threw an electron at it, really uh, like a very 
energetic electron, but we're, we're not so much interested in, in, in little things like, like gases. We're interested in big complexes like um, proteins and, and um, bits of proteins or maybe a little bit smaller than like drugs. And usually as, as um, Mike was saying, uh, we, we ionize them and we like put a proton on them. And so, yeah, you can, a lot of these big things, you can easily put a proton on and, and ionize it that way. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, I do have an example where we did want to look at these noble gases, though, going back into my uh, graduate research. Um, I didn't get to do the actual work on this, but I got the, the joy of uh, experiencing the, uh, the measurements. Um, I was at the University of Florida, and we had a group um, that was before my time that actually installed a mass spectrometer in the base of the launch platform at Cape Canaveral. So back then it was for the space shuttles. And that was actually what they were doing. So we were looking at gases leaking off of the spacecraft right before launch to make sure that there was uh, no leaks coming from the, the spaceship. So in that case, we were looking down in that very small molecular region that we normally don't look at now. Um, so it is important to do that. Um, but the bulk of what we work on here at Thermo is for uh, larger molecules. Okay. So before I take any other questions, uh, I think we need to answer this first. Uh, Mr. Galadro's class is asking, what is R&D? R&D actually stands for research and development. So what we do is uh, when scientists come up with some ideas, we try to build some prototype test pieces. And then the scientists try to test their uh, what do you call it, uh, ideas and see if it works and then we actually get it into a product. So R&D stands for research and development. This is the phase uh, which happens before a product is qualified for production and goes into the market. All right, so next up question is from Lydia. I think uh, Michael has answered this earlier and uh, she's asking, what kind of problems do you solve or what is the application of your research? So uh, I can tell like, since we all are from R&D group, so we have products which are already in market, then scientists, uh, they come up with newer ideas to get better resolution or to solve more problems using mass spectrometers. So they give us some uh, requirements and we try to design those things for them and they, they test it and uh, if everything looks good and uh, if it's a value added to our customers, then we go into production with uh, newer and advanced models. So I think that would answer your question. Uh, and anonymous attendee has asked, your titles and job functions all sounds rather intimidating. Can you describe what prof professional life was like earlier in your careers? What can we wet behind the ears new college grad who is practiced at studying for exams, but not much else, except that first job in place like Thermo Fisher? So I, I can answer this. I, I don't know for sure about uh, Phil and Pablo, but I came straight out of grad school, straight into this uh, R&D environment. And I agree, it was very intimidating at the time. Looking back, uh, not so much, but at the time I remember being quite intimidated because I was going from books to the lab. And in grad school, you do get quite a bit of lab time to prepare you for it. Um, but I had this expectation that once I jumped over into the professional world, everything was gonna be very different. And it wasn't, it re really wasn't. The lab environment is very similar. The collaborations with other scientists and engineers is, is very similar. It, it's I think the biggest difference is hands-on and much more focus in, in your field. Whereas when you're in school, you're learning the, as much as you can about everything. And then when you get into the field, you really find a specialty pretty quickly. This was actually one of the questions which I also wanted to ask. So Philip, would you also like to add something to this? Like uh, when you are studying in college, what were the kind of subjects which interest you? What kind of projects you did and how it helped you secure this job? Yeah, I, w I was thinking that, you know, as I was thinking of, 
the different things I've done, it's all been kind of this random walk of just trying to find kind of the most interesting thing for me at the time. And when I was in college, I was studying chemistry. Well, you know, initially I was like a pre-medicine student. And then I, I kind of realized quickly that I, I kind of liked being, thinking about things and being um, a little bit more by myself, even though you know, we come here and we work together with lots of people, but then we come back and, and we, we work on our own stuff um, and then we go present it. It's kind of this circle. But so, so I was I was studying chemistry and then just kind of randomly, like a, a professor said, hey, maybe, maybe this would be interesting. And I tried doing some research with him and it was, you know, n nothing related to what I'm doing now, but it's just kind of this process of thinking about problems and solving problems that, that, w that we went through, I, I think. Yeah, for me, for me, it was uh, similar, like Phil described. So I was just doing just some topic uh, during my PhD, and then I spent just some time with some old, some professor, which was almost retired in Germany, and I found very interesting what he was doing. So I just changed, like kind of uh, to another thing, and then and then continued just also just changing in my next position and. It was yeah always just like trying just to to check just for the most interesting and this is this is a nice thing I think from Thermo which of course you are at the end want just to have just a product that the, the, the yeah the customers just can take advantage of and all that but at the beginning especially it's just pretty pretty just like well having an idea and testing the idea if this works it doesn't work and, and learning in the process which is I think the, the nice thing of, of this job for me at least. Okay, so next just a little technical. So they want to know what kind of molecules that you are investigating and why, what are they used for? Well, I, I could say the one of the big things that our instruments are known for is, is studying proteins and peptides. And this is an interesting thing because maybe you guys know about in you know, we have solved like the genome, like we know, like a C you can, you can figure out what the someone's genome is and genes, they code for proteins. So even though you have some, you know, blueprint of what makes you up, um, it's like, you don't actually know what was made until you measure the proteins. And so that's the really important thing that, that, that we measure this, um, biologists, especially they want to know what actually are the proteins and how do they change as, um, an organism is say is sick or not sick or given a drug or, or what have you. So that's one kind anyways. Yeah. So uh, another question, it sounds interesting. Uh, is it hard being an R&D scientist? And what did you want to do this study? Uh, they said, why did you want to do this study? So for me, um, I don't consider it hard because it's kind of just the way I think, um, and, and I know in talking with a lot of my colleagues, it, it's, it's similar. Um, if you have a, a, an inquisitive uh, mind and, and you're generally liking to test things, I mean, that's the environment that we're in. We're constantly just doing observations um, and hypotheses, and we're testing out those hypotheses. And it's just, um, an it's like a big sandbox to, to, to say why 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 uh except for we don't just get to say why we also have to say because because right we have to do a lot of the investigation to find out why but we're asking as many questions as as we're answering so it it just it's kind of a uh an opportunity to learn and continuously learn and not in the boring sit down and read a book and, and never test it, but actually get out and play with things and, and play with uh, new hardware, new software, develop new software. Um, sometimes you'll come up to a situation where um, the answer is as simple as going to Pablo and saying, hey, Pablo, you studied this, I didn't. Can you teach me this? And then you walk away a little more enlightened or more confused, but you have more questions to follow, right? And then sometimes we don't have somebody to explain to us um, either from their, their previous experience or, or from uh, lectures or something they've seen. And then you're kind of up against the wall and then you need to find a way to answer that question. So it, it's, it's not necessarily a difficulty. Um, you're never expected to have all the answers. Um, you're not even expected to have all the questions. It's just 
be part of that conversation. It's a continuous conversation about understanding more and more about mass spectrometry and these molecules that we're investigating, in my opinion. Okay. The next, we have another question from Mr. Garado's class, and they want to know, what are your favorite things to do in the lab? So I think uh, all of you should answer this. Uh, Phillips, let's start with you. What is your favorite thing to do at, in the lab? Thing to do? Um, I, I do a lot of this, um, like controlling the instrument. I really like um, writing codes that like tell the instrument to do this thing or that thing. And maybe my favorite thing is, um, yeah, like to make some kind of um, like a procedure that makes the instrument do something and, and, and then I see the results. And then and if this is all part of some, as Michael says, like some question and some testing, then when you actually find out and get a result, like that's really satisfying. So I, I like this whole kind of process of, of um, I like that process, I guess, yeah, of writing little codes. Pablo, how about you? What is your favorite thing in lab? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a favorite, uh, a really, really favorite thing. I think it's it's really like, uh, well, like you said, like uh, the whole the whole way to that. So what I like is that uh, it's very diverse. So you start just simulating something like uh, what you are going to spec, do some calculations. Then you talk with the with you and other engineers uh, just to to actually turn into the the instrument, and then you do the test in the lab, doing just some software. So for me, it's just like I mean, what I like is like I get I get a little bored if I'm doing just the same thing too long. So I like actually this diversity more than the. More, more than just one specific thing, but yeah, like like the end, like the cake at the end, like if you just like make it just like thing is working, then yeah, this is really really enjoyable. Hey, so yeah, I I, I like the build. It, it's just really fun. Uh, I mean, because these instruments are are mechanical beings, right? And we have to build them, and so I'll spend a lot of time with a wrench and a, a screwdriver in hand and I may as well be building on a car or you know building on a house or something like that right you're still doing a lot of hands-on work um, and, and the diversity of tasks that Pablo mentioned is also really nice you're not sitting there doing the same thing over and over again you're you might be building all week but you'll be building on different things um, you'll be writing code uh, it's just a lot of building things that didn't really exist before you got your hands on them. Yeah, adding to that, since I'm working with uh, Michael, he actually tells you about pretty much what materials you can use and he makes your life easier. So all you have to concentrate is on the design aspect of it. So yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, sorry to interrupt, but that, that collaboration is really important. Um, I, I think because even though we're working on these these projects together we're coming at it from different angles right so um the interactions that deep and i will often have is i'll say this is my problem this is what we need to build and these are the constraints and in this case that, that he mentions the constraint is well we need to use a certain type of material because we need to isolate um, electrical signals um, so that they don't cross a crosser but it also needs to be a material that can withstand a certain temperature and it needs to be a shape similar to this. And then I pass it over the wall to Deep, and he sends back a model. And then we kind of go back and forth. And before too long, we're actually able to build that piece and then test it in the lab. So it's a constant back and forth. It's it's definitely a conversation over, over many weeks in order to produce something new. Yeah, and uh, for an earlier question where somebody was asking about uh, the things which scientists do is intimidating and things like that. So yeah, in the beginning when I joined, I saw the equipment and the kind of technology they use. So it was a little bit overwhelming, but eventually when you start a project and start working and interacting with people around, you realize that you are part of a team. So you don't have to know everything as long as uh, you can do your task and you are good at it, you get a guidance from other people and things just work. So yeah, collaboration and interaction with uh, the team helps you. And uh, as you take on projects and you become more hands-on, you get more confidence and things become easier. So yeah, I just wanted to put it out there. I have a quick comment on the confidence side. Um, if any of you that are listening to this think that uh, we were, you know, all-star scientists from, from age five up, 
that that wasn't the case for me. I always had the the small s interest in science, but I never even considered the possibility of being a big S scientist, you know, capital S scientist. It was, it started off with Inquisition, but I, I had an oper uh, uh, time in high school where my guidance counselor was surprised to find out that I wanted to go pursue a STEM education because it just wasn't, I, I wasn't an all-star high schooler. I, I, I wasn't somebody that was super confident that I was going to go and be a scientist and, and work for Thermo and all these things. I mean, it ended up taking some guidance to point that these are my interests and this is where they can be um, executed. But it didn't start right from the beginning. I, I meet scientists that pick up science from, you know, preschool and are with it the whole time. And I meet people that are, you know, after college and realize that they have an interest in, in this kind of thing. So uh, I've heard confidence come up a couple times and I, I can just straight up say I, was, I wasn't confident that I was gonna be a scientist until very late. I was almost 20 years old. Yeah, uh, I would like to add to that from engineering aspect. When I finished my engineering, all I knew was what all tools are available for me to solve a problem, but I wasn't proficient in any of them. So everything I learned was at work by using and employing and uh, it was a uh, slow learning and uh, I think it took me two years almost to get to speed to use all the tools at my disposal. So this is not my first job. I am coming from a manufacturing uh, we, uh, company. So there I worked for eight years. So yeah, don't worry about knowing everything. All you have to know is uh, in your field, what are the tools which are available to you, how you can access them and you get proficient by using them. All right, so I think we have only three more minutes. Uh, so we have uh, two questions. I think you all can answer quickly. Uh, first off, uh, people want to know, is there any role models in your life which you who are inspired by? And second question I would like you all to answer is, what is your favorite chemical reactions? So yeah, let's go in order again. Let's go with Philip first. Oh, so what was the first one? Oh, role models? Yes. You know, well, as far as like Thermo Fisher, I was actually like inspired in graduate school. So, so as we say, like I had no idea what I was going to do for most of high school or, or, or um, undergraduate. And then I, I somehow ended up in graduate school doing a certain thing. And then I actually read a bunch of papers in like a book chapter by some of the scientists at Thermo Fisher. And I was like really inspired by these guys. And they were kind of like seemed to me like they were like the professionals of what I did, like almost like I looked at them as like the Yankees or, you know, some sports figures. And so there's a couple of guys at Thermo Fisher right now, you know, we have this long history and they were really my models. Um, and Second question was your favorite chemical reaction. Chemical reaction, gosh, you know, that's the funny thing is like, yeah, I studied chemistry, but I, I can't actually really remember um, any of them. The, the only thing I can remember is this one mass spectrometry related one called the McLafferty rearrangement, but uh, I can't even remember what the heck that is. It's like something with rings, like opening and closing. So, but yeah, don't ask me about chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to Pablo next. Yeah, I, I want to start just with uh, with the chemical reaction. I, I really have no clue. I mean, I'm physicist by training, so I really <laughs> I really deal with very small things, and I get lost very easy. That that's the that's one of the things that I have. Just people around here, like they really know chemistry and, and can guide me. And uh, well, role model, I have to say like the, the person that impressed me the most uh, was, uh, well, it's called Peter Tennis. It's just a scientist, which is already retired. He did really, I mean, he was a candidate for the Nobel Prize. I mean, he's really one of the most impressive uh, person I, I, I have just the luck to work with. And what, what impressed me is like, I mean, and coming back just to, to the conversation before, it's just like, well, what is more impressive is like the guy was always able to say, I don't know about anything, even if he looks like a very wise scientist. But he, when he didn't know any, uh, something, he just plain tell you, I don't know. I have to, to learn this. And this is this was very, very important for me to learn, actually. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we are almost out of time, Michael. So can you make it real quick? Yeah. Uh Phil and Pablo are right. Uh, my, my answer is exactly the same as theirs. You're inspired by the people that we work with now. I'm amazed that I get to work with them. Um, and it's amazing when I hear some of those guys come to me and ask for uh, questions or say that they don't know. It, it, it's really cool to be part of the community. All right. I think uh, we are 
almost out of time and i think we can conclude here thank you philip pablo michael for your time and uh, i think people who attended got something out of it and it was inspirational for them i would like to conclude here thank you everyone thank you thank you